hear me okay? to be here this morning speaking on a topic that's really dear to me. You heard a little bit about what I do, right? So silence is something that comes very naturally to me. Um, I'm an only child. I'll share a little bit about how I grew up and how I really leaned into these pockets of silence to create freedom in my life. So my talk this morning is called Finding Freedom Through Silence and what that looks like, right? How we find it. I want you to take a moment to indulge me. If you feel okay with that, close your eyes or just bring them to a little bit of a soft close. You don't have to close them all the way if that doesn't feel safe. And just feel your breath for a moment. This may be the first time that you notice that you're breathing today. Notice your next exhale. Notice your next inhale. And then reflect back on the first thing you did when you opened your eyes this morning. If you grabbed your phone, turned off the alarm, maybe greeted someone in your home, another person or a pet. If you pause for a moment to breathe, if you notice the temperature of the room, if you notice that you were thirsty, if you got anxious about making it here on time like I did. or if you don't remember, and that's okay too. And come back to your next exhale. And we'll take a big collective breath in through the nose. Big exhale out the mouth. And when you feel ready, allow your eyes to flutter open. Was it easy to think about what you did this morning? Did people find that to be easy? Yeah, good, good. So when I started really digging into the meat of what I was gonna talk about today, it was snowing. We're not gonna discuss the fact that I maybe procrastinated a little bit because that was on Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> it was pretty early this week, but it was the first real snow of the year, right? And I was in bed with my husband, he was asleep and snoring and all these thoughts just started coming to me while it was snowing outside. And I can remember seeing the reflection of the snow through my window and also how quiet it got when it was snowing. And for some reason, I'd never realized like, how silent it gets when it's snowing outside. And so I started doing all this research and I found out through this really cool physics process that I don't quite understand that snow actually, actually absorbs sound. And so there's something that happens when it's snowing outside where there's this brief moment of stillness, of clarity, where everything just kind of pauses, right? Like everything pauses and you can just be still and hear yourself. And so that is the energy that I really leaned into and where I found freedom to come up with what I was gonna talk about today. Chris and I were talking about what our word was gonna be for going to the next slide. I don't know if we came up with anything. It was just, okay, I'm just gonna give you a thing. <laughs> So I've always been really connected to nature, to the rhythm of nature. I've always been really connected to this idea of freedom. I'm a life path five, if anyone knows what that means. I'm always looking for ways to feel free in my body and feel free in what I do and who I am. A lot of people don't know this, but I grew up in the South. If you read my interview, maybe you know that. I'm from a small town in Texas. My whole family lives on one road in Marshall, Texas. It's close to Shreveport, Louisiana tiny little town, right? And so that street is named after my maternal family. And they're all there. I grew up in a house with my mom, my grandma, and my great-grandma. 
all being in the house together. So four generations of women. I don't think I really knew how special that was until I grew up and became an adult and started talking to other people about it. But we all grew up in this home together, um, the home that my great grandmother lived in when she died. And so my grandpa was there too, but we'll get to him. And the next slide we'll go to in a few. My great grandmother, she's in the middle. We can go back. She's in the middle in the pink. That's Mama Lou, Lucille. And she was a absolute fireball of energy, but she didn't say a whole lot. She had that fiery red hair that you can see in the picture. And she taught me freedom through observation. She would sit in her rocking chair and she had this Maxwell Haas coffee can that she would spit her chew tobacco in. She was a complete and total badass. And she also had a shotgun that she kept close by. <laughs> but we lived, lived in the South. And so she would just watch, right? Just watch the world happening. She would watch people, she would watch their interactions. And through her observations, she would make very clear like judgments about who she trusted and who she didn't trust, who was to be around our family and who wasn't to be around our family. And I learned that just from watching her. My grandmother, who is on the left on your side, surrounded by the plants, Sassy Gloria, she still lives on that road in Texas, and she is a lot of energy. <laughs> She's a lot of energy, and I adore her. She taught me to connect to nature and to find freedom that way by teaching me to grow my own things. And when I was thinking about those lessons, I realized that she never used a lot of words. I would just work like in tandem with her. That's how she would teach me how to milk a cow, how she would teach me how to feed a, a calf, how she would teach me to grow herbs and grow things in our backyard and then harvest them. And then my mom in the black and white picture, I love that picture of her. That was shortly before I was a thing, um, before I came around. And maybe changed that party up a little bit that she was having in that picture. Uh, that's my mom, Rita, and she lives here now. My mom was one of my biggest teachers of freedom because she gave me permission to really explore the world through a completely unfiltered lens, just to be me. And she created this structure and these boundaries for me to exist within. But outside of that, I was free to figure out who I was. If you read um, the interview, the question and answer session, you saw that I used to cut pictures out of library books. I feel like maybe that wasn't OK. But I can't remember her ever being mad at me that I did it. She would just talk about why I shouldn't, and then also what I was trying to accomplish with it, like how to create with what I had available to me versus cutting a library book up and defacing it. And she also taught me how to lead without judgment, right? How to meet people where they are and give them space to tell their story and do so without any judgment and also without any expectation from that person. So these three women were my greatest teachers in freedom, my greatest teachers in observation, my greatest teachers in silence and what comes from that. And I was lucky, very lucky and grateful to grow up with all of them modeling that for me in my home without even realizing that it was happening. So that's me, that's my grandpa who is <laughs> clearly double fisting in this picture because he lived in the house with me and my mom and my grandma and her mom <laughs> and I can imagine it was a lot. You can see the look on his face, it's just a, it's like smiling but also a little bit stressed. <laughs> and then there's me in the background. I don't know what's happening here um, but I was living my best life and that was me as a kid, right? Just completely unfiltered and free. I didn't feel like there were things that I couldn't do. I felt like the world was my oyster. I felt like my words mattered. I felt like I could create, I could draw, I could play with my food, I could jump, I could dance, I could have dreams to be a princess and work at McDonald's and be a farmer all at the same time, right? I could do all of those things and none of it mattered because it's who I was. My truth was very grounded and rooted in who I was. I was always very connected, as I mentioned, to nature and the cycles of nature. I was always outside, running around. I caught a rabbit one time when I was four. That's like a notorious story in my family. Fishing, just living life, right? Enjoying what happened when I was absorbing the energy of the world around me. So as the season started to change and I grew up and I transitioned and became an adult and made my way to Ohio, which is a whole nother story, I learned from all of those seasons. We can go forward. 
So summer for me is a season of celebration, a season of abundance. You think about the things that you do in summer, right? There's really long days and there's lots of sunshine. It's hot outside. There's celebrations, there's barbecues. You want to be around people more. So I leaned into that energy. As summer transitioned to fall, I learned this balance of work and play and what it feels like to really pause and settle into the abundance that I had in my life, to really be present with the harvest that I created during those summer months. So summer brought fall and fall brought pauses to really be in love with life. And that's when I got married. And then fall came to become winter, right? And winter was a season for me where I really tuned into stillness and where I really tuned into silence and where I could find myself again, where I could come back to myself after these times where life was really busy and there was a bit more energy and a bit more noise. And then as fall or as winter turned to spring, I was reminded of rebirth. The fact that we can always start over the fact that we can always begin again, the fact that blossoming and blooming is never ending, and that that's always accessible to us. Next slide. So in the middle of all this growing and transitioning with the seasons and changing, I graduated from college, I got a job, I bought a house, I got married, I did all the things, right? And I was working a really successful career in 2015. I had all the degrees and diplomas and certificates and all of the accolades, and I was successful, really successful. And I loved what I did. I loved what I did. And I was also miserable. I worked a lot. I worked a lot of hours. And somewhere in all of those hours that I worked and all of that work I did and everything that I gave to other people, I lost those lessons that I learned from my mom and my grandma and my great grandma. I lost that idea of what freedom feels like in my body and who I was became defined by what I did, right? My value was completely wrapped up in my ability to produce my ability to be successful by other people's standards, my ability to work a whole lot of hours and say, oh, I overdid it this week, I worked 60 hours, or last night I only slept two hours, how many hours did you sleep? So I found my value in that, and I wasn't well. I thought I was. I look back at old pictures <laughs> from that time, and I was dressed really cute, but on the inside it was like, oh, girl, you were not okay, <laughs> not okay at all. I didn't really take time off. So much of my worth and my value, again, was just wrapped up in what I did and who I was to other people, not who I was to myself. So I took a trip with my husband. We got away for like two and a half weeks. And at that point, it was the furthest I had been away from my work in a really long time. And I had a lot of anxiety about going. There was this idea like that I couldn't be away from what I did. And in that trip, I started to find myself again. I started to feel my breath again in my body, and I started to hear myself again. And when I did all of that, I think my initial statement was, I don't wanna go back, let's just live in Amsterdam. And thankful he's a bit more reasonable than I can be at some time, so he's like, well, let's talk more about that. Like, what's at the, what's at the root of that? And I decided at that point, I don't, want, I don't want what I created for myself when I go back. I don't want to go back into the chaos and the noise. I want this person back, like the person that I am when everything else is silenced. I want that back. So we came back, and I decided to leave my job. This is not where I tell you to do the same. <laughs> I don't ever do that. <laughs> it's a personal journey, friends. But I chose to leave my job. And it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And I knew it was, what, it was what was right, right? Like it wasn't the messaging coming from the world or from anyone else. It was the messaging that came when I was still, when I was silent, when everything else turned off and I could hear myself again. It was the message that came with that. So we kind of played around with it and talked through it. And I'm like, I'll give three months notice. And I didn't do that. I ended up giving seven weeks, which is still a lot and transitioned out, and that was in 2015. It was a hard, hard, hard choice. But let me take that back. It wasn't a hard choice, it was a hard transition. 
because I've been so covered up, this freedom in myself, right, of who I am and my own authentic voice have been so covered up by other people's expectations, even by other people's values about what it means to be successful, what it means to be a black woman in her 30s who leads a career, what all of that means. And to leave those pieces behind and come back to myself was definitely one of the most challenging journeys that I've had and one of the best journeys that I've had. So let's come back to your morning. Honest moment. How many people looked at their phone like first thing in the morning? Yeah, I look too because I'm like, am I late? How many people check text messages or emails before they got out of bed? That's like the majority of the room. How many of us check those messages or emails before we got here, even if you didn't check them in the bed? Yeah. How many of us got a little bit anxious about something that we have to do when we leave here or over the weekend or coming up next week or the fact that it's like in the thick of holiday season and you haven't brought the right gift for the right person yet, all of those things. So that's the majority of the folks here that have been stressed out a little bit just by starting our morning. On average, we receive thousands of messages per day, thousands of messages that are marketing messages about who we are, what we want, what we need, what we don't want, what we don't need. And I just learned that as adults, we are distracted about every eight minutes. And once we get distracted in that eight minute period, every eight minutes, it takes us about 20 minutes to get back to what it is that we were doing beforehand. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. And so then it got me to thinking about why it's so much more challenging. We were talking about this this morning to read a book now, just to sit down and actually read a book. And then your phone beeps and you're like, oh, that one email, I'll reply back to that one email. Next thing you know, it's six months later and that one book is still there <laughs> waiting to be read. Distractions are everywhere, everywhere. And the world is only getting busier and noisier and more chaotic in some ways, right? And so how can we find our freedom within all those distractions that exist? Because some things we can't turn off, right? Like I, I have to do certain things. I have to respond to emails. It doesn't necessarily have to be in two minutes, but I do have to respond to emails. I have to pay my mortgage. I can't just be free flowing through life, just expecting everything to work out. So there's some expectations, some things that we have to do, but how can we create the boundaries for us to find our freedom within? And for me, that's what so much of this journey has been about. So today, I am the co-founder of Root. You heard a little bit about it, Restoring Our Own Through Transformation. I think um, Jessica Roach had to leave, but she's the other co-founder of the organization, and I'm a doula. So I support women who are in any space with reproductive choice, choosing to have a baby, not have a baby, whatever that looks like for them. I work along a league of really amazing humans to change the narrative surrounding black women and childbirth in our city, in our country, and also black infant mortality. And I'm really proud to say that we have a 0% black maternal mortality and black infant mortality rate in our organization. We can go to the next slide. It's my, one of my favorites. And sometimes I get to be there when babies are born. <laughs> so that little one on the left was supposed to be here today. He wasn't, his mom wasn't able to make it. He was not driving here alone. <laughs> but his mom wasn't able to make it. He was supposed to be here today. And on the right, you see myself with my doula sister, Laurel. She's also a doula. Um, and she had a, chose to have a home birth and birth a almost 10 pound baby boy as his son was coming up at home. Next slide. I'm also the co-creator of the yoga carriage at Replenish. Hopefully you all are familiar with Replenish, and if you're not, hopefully you get familiar with Replenish. It's an amazing place, and it's one that I was connected to before I started this journey of like, oh, I think I wanna leave my job and all of this. Um, so a place that I was always connected to and a mission that I was always connected to. So Replenish is co-founded by these three beautiful women on the couch. Chanel, Deja, and their mom, Wavette. They created a mission that speaks to the greatness of all people finding space to create self-care and really redefining how self-care looks, right? We've talked about how the world is busy, how the world is loud and noisy, and there are things happening and things that we have to do. But what can we do in five minutes? 
What can we do in 10 minutes? What can we do in an hour? Sitting for a moment and just closing your eyes and reflecting on your day, that minute of time that we took to do that felt very different than a minute of having a conversation with another person or different than a minute in traffic. We'll give them some silence too. <laughs> So within the Replenish mission is the yoga carriage. That is our donation-based yoga hub. It's a space that's available for all people. I teach meditation there. I teach yoga there. And we are located right in the middle of the city. So there's a hospital close by, and the helicopter flies over sometimes and shakes the building a little bit. And there's a dump truck that goes down the alley. So it's not a silent space to come and meditate or practice yoga. And we really lean into that because that's everyday life, right? Everyday life has noise and sound and expectations. There's lots of that happening. But how can we come back to ourselves in the middle of the dump trucks and the helicopters and the kids that need something from us and the emails and the dings and the bings and the noises and the sounds? How can we come back to ourselves? So Chanel and Deja are my partners in our yoga carriage mission. That's us fiercely walking down the street. Those pictures, um, all three of those pictures were taken by Rachel Barrel, who's in the back with her little one. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> and so we're really redefining how self-care looks and how it looks to find yourself in the middle of everything that's happening in a very busy world. So... Take another moment to close your eyes. And come back to your breath. Noticing that we aren't in a perfectly quiet space. There's the sounds of the building. the sounds of the world carrying on outside of this space. And just begin to create rhythm with your breath. Taking inhales in through the nose. Exhaling out the mouth. And taking five more breaths just like this and feeling the flow of your inhale and exhale. Hearing the sound of your breath. When you feel complete, you can open your eyes again. So my challenge to all of us is when those accolades don't exist, when you get rid of all the things behind our names, all the titles of who we are, who are you? Right? If you let go of what you do, who you are to other people, if you let go of the way that you show up for other people, all the things that you do really well, that you do really well, who are you at your core? What do you value? How do you show up for yourself and the way that you show up for others? Who are you? So tomorrow is the first day of winter and it's really sunny outside right now. I'll take it, it's fine. Tomorrow is the first day of winter, it's the winter solstice. So we're moving into the season that invites us to slow everything down. Tomorrow is the shortest day and the longest night of the year. What can we do with that space? The space to reflect inward, the space to tune in, to quiet everything around us. So perhaps that looks like pausing just as we did throughout 
the talk today to take a few breaths before you start your day, before you grab your phone and start checking the emails and the messages and all those thoughts get inserted that maybe aren't even yours. It's taking time to step away from the TV or social media. It's taking time to actually sit and sip slow you ever been moving so fast when you're drinking something hot, you burn your mouth, right? To actually sit and sip slow. It's taking the time to feel your feet hitting the snow when you walk and actually listen to the sound that that makes because it's really beautiful. And it's time to decide to choose, if you choose, to figure out what freedom looks like for you. For me, it's not the absence of structure or boundaries. It's not that. It's centering my voice and my truth in the middle of everything it is that I do and allowing my whole self to show up in every room, every space, every organization, everything that I do. Thank you all so much.